Hi, my name is Petrosem and I am the founder of Passwords.com. I'm really happy to be speaking once again at the Crypto and Privacy Village here, this time at the DEF CON Safe Mode 2020 edition. Um, my talk is entitled Hacking Like Paris Hilton 14 Years Later and Still Winning. And uh, this is a, you know, a, 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 a talk that had been in the making for quite a few years by me uh, now. So I'm really, really happy to sort of tell the entire story on this one. First, a very quick introduction by myself, uh, of myself. Uh, here you have a tweet a couple of years ago when I said that I do have a certain interest in passwords and Cormac Hurley at Microsoft Research, he responds back saying that, confirm, I have a healthy curiosity while Torsum is pathologically obsessed with passwords and, well, digital authentication. So that's uh, basically me in a nutshell. Now, I do say this because uh, for this talk, it's uh, important for me to provide a bit of background and context to the stuff that I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about essentially two topics, hijacking of mobile phones in different ways and also voicemail hacking, getting access to your or somebody else's voicemail uh, with the provider in question that you are using. And why am I talking about this? Well, my interest is in passwords and digital authentication. And in some cases, we have stuff like two-factor authentication, which is, you know, everybody is talking about now, you should be using two-factor authentication. I agree. But in a lot of cases, people are using their mobile phones to do exactly this. In fact, uh, you know, you are using two-factor authentication using text messages maybe email, which more and more people are probably using on their phones or iPads uh, anyway. Uh, there can be also voice-based uh, SMS two-factor authentication. Uh, you have in-app push messages. You have TOTP authenticator apps. Google Authenticator is probably the most common one. And of course, maybe you're using WebAuthn as well, either through a hardware key or maybe you have it integrated in your operating system like Android has today. And um, if I want to hack into your account somewhere and you are using two-factor authentication, two-factor authentication, well, it doesn't actually block me from hacking your account. It makes it more difficult. But the only thing that is certain in life are death and taxes and everything else can be hacked and probably will be sooner or later. So mobile hi hijacking, something that came up to me many, many years ago when we saw sort of like um, two-factor authentication by SMS coming in as a thing that some were using. And I got curious, well, you know, how can I bypass this? How can I hack it? And so on. So seven years ago, actually, the uh, Norwegian Government Agency for Financial Supervision and Regulation they issued their annual report about, you know, the financial market in, in Norway with lots of interesting information to some nerds, including um, losses due to like skimming, fiscal card skimming, and also online banking attacks, as an example. And they said, and this is 2013, they did say that they were expecting a rapid increase in mobile hacking. And they said that they were cautious and they were concerned about the fact that people were starting to have their entire uh, digital life, including banks, including, you know, uh, passport information, you, you know, your money uh, and your digital life on your phone. And you would be carrying your phone with you all the time. And it was, you know, I, I'm sort of willing to say that, you know, they were basically ahead of the time, at least for Norway, where, where I live, uh, because did we see any, you know, sudden increase in mobile hacking in 2013? Not really. And it also depends on what kind of mobile hacking are we talking about. Now, here's a typical example uh, that you have probably seen. Now, the message here is a text message received in Norwegian. Uh, and and the, the, <laughs> the simple translation is, you know, we could not invoice your membership for this month 
Try again to update your payment details in order to continue watching Netflix. And there's a totally legit link down below that you're supposed to click. Now, I was actually sitting on my couch in my living room and watching Netflix with a woman next to me uh, on a Saturday evening. And, you know, we had turned down the light, but I had turned down the lights and we had some, we had some tips and we had some food and, and we, you know, enjoying a good movie. And then suddenly it says ping in her phone and politely, of course, I stop Netflix and I look away. And she's typing and she's typing and she's typing even more on, on her phone. And I'm, well, I'm sort of getting curious about, you know, what happened now. And then she suddenly asks me, is it common that Netflix asks for your social security number? And that's the moment when I turn on the lights and turn off the TV and said, hey, love's got to wait. We do have a security problem at hand. Give me your phone. And I got it, and this is, this is the text message that I saw on, on, on screen, and I said, well, you have probably already given away your username and your password, so now we have to change that for Netflix. Simple scam, a lots of people, lots of people fall victim to this one. But it's the big thing. Well, monetary-wise, I don't know. Uh, is it a threat to society? No, not really. But we have also had other and more, should I say, interesting cases in here in Norway. As an example, we had a minister in the government who actually went on a, on a holiday trip to Iran with his new Iranian girlfriend. And when you are a minister, you know, you should be sort of careful of, of that, at least in the current political climate. And he did travel and he did not tell the secret police, he didn't tell any uh, intelligence services or lifeguards, he didn't tell the prime minister or anyone else, he just went for it. And that's a big no-no. And when they came back, back, one of the statements that he issued was pretty amazing. He said that, you know, he had been, you know, traveling before, he knew his stuff when it comes to security, so he said that his phone was secure because most of the time it was turned off and was just left in the hotel room in Iran. Now, this and a lot more about uh, you know, this person, and in this case, led to the simple fact he was forced to resign from his position. Now, for mobile hijacking, I will be talking about port out attacks, which I have chosen to call them, and to differentiate that a little bit from SIM swap attacks. And I will also talk about spoofing, the sort of the thing of, you know, what can you do when you are trying to pretend to be somebody else or if you actually succeed in becoming somebody else. Uh, there is also traditional fraud involved in, in uh, mobile hijacking, as something as simple as having an insider issuing a SIM card for you in the wrong name and so on. I will not be talking about that. Port out attacks are the simple process of transferring a phone number to another operator. That is one of the things you can do in Norway. Uh, you don't have to change your number, you can transfer it freely to any operator you want to. And when I started, started working for my current employer three years ago, I came to the, to, you know, for, for my first work day on, on August 1st, and I have been a customer of one telecom provider, Telenor, since basically the dawn of time, more or less. And my employer said, you know, just give, give us your name and your phone number and, you know, we'll take care of porting it to the new provider that we are using, where we will be paying for your phone subscription, period. And I was like, you just need my name and your, my phone number. Yeah, that's it. So I said, well, it, it's Pertwo, Sam. And uh, my phone number is da 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 da. And by the way, phone numbers are by default public, available to anyone in Norway, unless you specifically say, I do not want my number listed, or eventually also, I want a secret phone number. There's a difference there. Um, and <laughs> they, my, my employer just sent an email to their telco saying that, we want to transfer the subscription for Pear's phone, current phone. This is the name, this is the phone number, and we want to pour that out, out and over to your service, and we want it done as soon as possible. 
by email. And I got handed a new SIM card in an envelope at work. And then I was told that, and, and this was on a Tuesday, and I was told that the port out will happen on uh, Friday at midday noon. Uh, the porting actually happened on Thursday, one 24 hours before it was supposed to happen. It happened at 12 o'clock. So suddenly my phone stopped working and I had to take out the uh, uh, current SIM card and insert a new card from the new provider that I had been given at work. And this means that there was a time window of approximately 48 hours, maybe even less, where I would uh, have to sort of detect that something is wrong, understand what is actually happening right now, and then act before it would be too late. And not only that, but I have also been told, without being told the exact um, time frames, I have been told that you can ask these telecom operators as well to do a very quick port of your number, and then it will probably happen in a few hours. And not only you know, was this process going faster than expected, it happened in 48 hours or less, but for me to be able to understand you know, if, if somebody initiated that without asking me or telling me at all, these are the two text messages that I would have to understand and react upon before it was too late. The first text message came from my current provider, which was Telenor, uh, in Norwegian, it says, you know, thank you for being a customer with us. It's sorry to see you go. And here's a questionnaire with an HTTP link, unencrypted link, where they just want to ask me a single question about, you know, why did I leave or would I like to come back again? And from my new phone provider selected by my employer, I also got a text message. Interesting fact number one, the sender number is an invalid phone number. It's not possible to respond back to the number 4705050, as you can see on the slide. And it says, welcome to Telia, which is the name of the operator. Uh, and your phone number is now transferred to us. Have a nice day. Best regards, Telia. That's it. And I'm just imagining my own mother receiving these, these two text messages. And I am very certain that she would not really understand what's happening here. And I'm not sure if she would actually call either of these two operators in time to understand what just happened. And one of the things that I did as part of this, because I've been working for several years looking into, you know, the, this issue of sort of like being able to hijack somebody's phone number in, in, through social engineering and so on, do to do it online in a store. And, and, and so forth. And I talked to the largest financial newspaper in Norway, Dagens Næringsliv, about this when I was sort of ready and said, I have some theories, I have some facts, but I need to be careful not to step over you know, the, the red line on what is uh, legal and what is illegal to do. But you are a newspaper, so you can sort of defend doing things that might be considered shady because you are sort of working for the public and you should look into this. So they did. And they actually made an agreement with one of the most famous bloggers that we have in, in Norway, Sophie Elisa. And they asked her, would it be okay for us to try to sort of hijack your phone number? And she agreed to that. And the newspaper actually has a video online that you can watch for free. It's uh, like three minutes long, where a female reporter from the newspaper that looks nothing like this blogger, she goes out on the street to a couple of sales people from um, a phone company and she hands over a business card that is fake, obviously. She printed it on her own printer and she says, I'm Sophie Leeson, I would like to port my number over to you. And with the fake business card only, they accept that as a valid ID and it initiates the process. And the newspaper, and of course, Sophia Lisa, they were shocked that, is it that easy? You know, you can, a fake business card, really? And this was scary, and it was scary to me, it was scary to the newspaper, it was scary, uh, scary to, to, very scary to, to everyone, to be uh, precise. 
Now for SimSwap, uh, I know that SimSwap is the standard term to use, especially in the US on, on these things. And I wanted to make a difference be between what I call mobile hijacking and, and SimSwap attacks or port out and SimSwap attacks here. SimSwap to me is the same as in the US. You uh, will uh, get new SIM cards for a specific subscription for a specific phone number. Uh, I don't know if you can do this in the US, I don't know if you can do this in Sweden or Denmark for that matter, but at least in Norway, as part of your current service with your phone company, you can get a new SIM card and you don't need any sort of valid reason. You can just say, I want a new SIM card and you will get one. You can also get a twin SIM card so you can have two phones that are essentially the same. So if somebody calls you, it will ring in both phones. And you can also get a data SIM card that, of, you know, given the name, you can not use it for making or accepting phone calls in or out, but you can use it for data traffic only. And you can get a specific data SIM card for your existing uh, service subscription with all the operators, to the best of my knowledge. And the same thing applies here. Fake ID um, will probably get you one of these SIM cards that will also... Um, Given the circumstances, you will also be able to do sort of full or at least limited sort of surveillance of whatever victim you are targeting. So it became very obvious to us that we have a problem with identifying people and we also have a problem in a business to business relationship and in general uh, with authorization. If you are not ordering or changing a phone sub subscription uh, for yourself, but for somebody else, how do we identify and how do we find out whether you're authorized to make those changes on behalf of another person? Obviously, there was a problem with this. One of the revelations made by the newspaper Dagens Næringsliv was that the telecom operator Telia, which is... Uh, working uh, out of many different countries, its, uh, its uh, home base is in, in Sweden, um, they found out that in Sweden the government requires Telia to ask for proper ID when you are setting up, terminating or changing or moving a phone subscription uh, like passport or something uh, digital ID which is government approved. Now, Telia also operates in Norway, and we also have digital identities in Norway called Bank ID. And in Sweden, they are using Bank ID to identify their customers. So it was a pretty easy question. Are you using Bank ID or something similar in Norway as well? And Telia, they responded, no, we don't do that. And when the question came up, why don't you do that? The, question, the answer to the question was saying that, we do as we are required to do by the government in Norway. And the answer to that again is the government in Norway didn't require the telephone operators to ask for, you know, any kind of solid ID, being it on paper like passport or driver's license or a digital version of a digital ID. Again, a big surprise. So I looked to the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S., uh, more specifically to Laurie Craner, who is uh, um, normally a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And she wrote several articles on the Federal Trade Commission website, one where she talks about how she got her phone hijacked through a SIM swap attack. It's an interesting article. It's definitely worth reading. And one of the things she did was to ask all the major mobile carriers in the U.S., what consumers could do to protect themselves from a mobile account takeover. One of the most important steps you can take is to establish a password or PIN that is required before making changes to your mobile account. Each of the carriers offers this feature to the customers in a slightly different way. And this was sort of good. I mean, social engineering, uh, PIN guessing and so on can probably still get past this, but at least it's one more speed bump for the bad actors to try to hijack your number and do a SIM swap attack. But interestingly, none of the providers in Norway had any feature like this at all in place. And to the best of my knowledge, 
they are still working on figuring out how to do this in Norway. So as a result of this, or one of the many results out of this process, which you know culminated in the, in the spring of 2019, that means last year, is our Minister of Digitalization at the time, Nikolai Astrup, he instructed the Norwegian Communications Authority, ENCOM, to implement security functions in order to prevent mobile hijacking in cooperation with the telecom sector. That is a pretty serious move to do when you instruct them to work on this immediately. And not only that, but also in September 20 of 2019, uh, the government also released a hearing uh, uh, named Actions to Prevent Mobile Hijacking. As a direct consequence of the stories made by Dagens Langsliv and by me uh, earlier in the spring, uh, this came out and there was a hearing process until December 2019 where, uh, you know, everybody, uh, government organizations and private people could then give their input on the proposal for changing changes to the existing law. Now, this hasn't passed into law yet, but we are sort of waiting for the results from the hearings to see what's going to happen next. And also, while working with this on my own and together with Dagen Snaringsleeve, I was not aware that a news website for the IT and security industry in Denmark were also looking into the same thing, more or less, in, 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 in Denmark with different providers. Simply, social engineering into stores selling SIM cards, making replacement SIM cards, and so on. And they succeeded many, many times and you know they posted this article among many others saying that after multiple multiple failures telcos are actually considering to completely stop handing out sim cards in physical stores now norway is next to sweden next to denmark and next to finland they are neighbors and we are very much alike in society in law in language and so on but one of the things that has been fascinating to me is to see the different reactions from the telcos, from newspapers, from you know, normal people like you and me on the street, and from politicians on how they have reacted to these stories in the media. Because stopping completely to hand out SIM cards in physical stores haven't even been mentioned by anyone in Norway or in Sweden at all, but it is pretty much the same operators working in these three countries. So it's kind of like, are you people not even talking to each other internally in the same company or what is happening here? So to sort of more better and better exemplify the problem of spoofing, I say, what if I could be you? as a bad actor. Now, this is Crypto and Privacy Village. You know, we have had lots of talks on this. You are most probably watching uh, EFF closely. You are watching what is happening in your country right now in terms of privacy. It doesn't look good quite a few places all over the world. Now, in Norway, we do consider ourselves, you know, a very safe, um, solid, democratic country with uh, a government that, you know, well, we trust our government, believe it or not. But still, there are cases where things are happening. Now, this one uh, is an article or a series of articles that were re released in the fall of 2019, Chasing Max. And uh, this is about a guy that has been caught by the police and he is charged for hacking the accounts of approximately 50 different random women around the country extracting pictures, videos, contact details, harvesting usernames and passwords, gaining access to Instagram, Facebook, and so on. 50 women randomly all over Norway. And the newspaper told us a story about Nina. Nina was smart. Nina was using two-factor authentication. 
SMS-based two-factor authentication. For her phone account, uh, for Facebook, for Google, for Apple, and so on. And she woke up one morning with a picture like this, where she had received authorization codes from different services like Microsoft, like Google, like Apple, in order to do a password reset. And she had lost access to a lot of her accounts and she really couldn't understand how did this happen because I was using two-factor authentication. And lots of people say that, well, if you have two-factor authentication, you're secure, right? Wrong. What they actually found out in this particular case is that Nina was using uh, um, Telia, one of the telecom providers in Norway, and they had a service called SMS Copy. You could log on to their web page, like, you know, my page, and you could configure the SMS Copy service, which is essentially a message service, so that if you receive a text message to your phone, Telia will also silently forward that text message either to another phone number or send it to an email address. You know, what could possibly go wrong with this? And in order to get access to the My Page at Telia, you needed a username and a password, and they did not offer any kind of two-factor authentication at all. So what this bad guy did, who is now being prosecuted by the police, he went to that page and tried to log in uh, with a lot of different usernames and passwords. And as we know, people are reusing passwords. And I suspect that he got in through credential stuffing or online password spraying. And by getting in there, he could configure the SMS copy service. He could order a password reset from different services. And although Nina received the messages, she received them in the middle of the night when she was sleeping. And he was up and he received the same messages and by that, he gained access to all the accounts of these women. And that, I think, serves as a really hard and scary example of what the possible consequences can be if you don't have secured your entire chain with two-factor authentication or something else. Two-factor authentication can be bypassed in so many different settings and scenarios. Now this was about hijacking your phone number and receiving your text messages and so on. But I've also been looking into voicemail hacking. And this goes back again to the title of, of Paris Hilton, because all the way back in 20, uh, 2006, sorry, um, there was a lot of articles around the world saying that, you know, um, um, uh, Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan had got into a sort of a disagreement and they were trying to hack each other's uh, phone numbers, uh, spread them online and also gain access to each other's voicemail boxes. And the story is, to the best of my knowledge, is that Paris Hilton gained access to the voicemail box of Lindsay Lohan. And in even mainstream Norwegian media, this was mentioned on August 27, 2006. And not only did they mention this happening, they also actually mentioned the specific service that Paris Hilton had been using to do this. Now, you know, if you Google voicemail hacking, you will find interesting results. One of them is a talk that has been presented at DEF CON before that also includes a tool that you can use for some services with voicemail where you can try to basically brute force the PIN code to get into the voicemail boxes. Some voicemail boxes will have a four digit PIN, three digits, five, six digits that are randomly selected and provided by the telco to the user. Other users, uh, sorry, other telecom providers may allow you to select your own PIN. One of the things we know from PIN code research is that as soon as you allow users to select their own PIN code, those PIN codes are not going to be any good at all in pretty much all cases. 
And there was also, uh, back in um, 10 years ago, there was also a large scandal with News of the World uh, in the UK, where the British royal family got their phones and their voicemail hacked by reporters that were able to extract messages that were, you know, most definitely not meant for the public to listen into. This was a big scandal, and also in this case, uh, the suspicion was targeted against the same service as Paris Hilton had been using several years earlier. Now, this is probably a picture that you have seen before. Uh, in order to do a password reset at Microsoft, you have several different options. You can have an email sent to you with a link that you need to click to gain access, or you can also ask to uh, use an authentication app if you have a TOTP app installed. Uh, and you can also have an SMS sent to you. So there, you know, with SMS, you already see one problem with the SMS copy service. But there are also services where, you know, to do a password reset and so on, uh, you can also ask the service provider to give you a robot call and to read the uh, PIN code for you out loud. So one of the things I was curious about is, hmm, can I initiate a password reset for someone online and ask that service to make a phone call and just well, go directly to voicemail and enter that uh, PIN code into the voicemail box. So I can get access afterwards, listen to the code and use it to get access to an account. Interesting experiment. So, you know, let's hack. And what I did, I used the same service as Paris Hilton from 2006, which is called Spoof Card. They are still operational today and they are still doing their fancy little tricks today, but of course they do say that this service is to protect your privacy and you should of course not use this for any kind of legal purposes. So I did, and the case number one was Telenor, the biggest telco in Norway. I managed to get access to people's voicemail, of course I did this under responsible disclosure, and I also talked to my potential victims, friends, family and others, co-workers and ask them, can I try this? And if you want to listen in, you can do that. I show them how I, gain, how I could very easily use spoof card to get access to their voicemail, listen to the messages, delete them, and also change the welcoming message for the voicemail. I told uh, Telnur about this on a Tuesday on, and on the Thursday they had fixed it. So in less than 48 hours, which is really, really good. They also, of course, after you know, fixing this, uh, there was a media article and they said that they were sorry for this and they acknowledged that this vulnerability had probably been available for use and abuse for 13 years or more, you know, dating all the way back to the Paris Hilton incident. 13 years. And the interesting thing is, this specific uh, service, Spoof Card, was mentioned all the way back in 2006 in Norwegian mainstream media. But when Telenor was informed about this in November 2019, they said, never heard of it. Which is, well, I mean, you don't have to read mainstream media, do you? But in this case, I was a bit, well surprised. And as a consequence of my findings in this, the uh, Norwegian uh, government agency that are overseeing the telecom industry in Norway, they chose to issue a fine of 1.5 million Norwegian krona, that is the equivalent of 165,000 US dollars today, as a fine because they didn't have sufficient security um, for the voicemail system. And depending on the country you're in, if you're in the US, I would guess a fine of 165,000 uh, US dollars doesn't sound much. In Norway, you know, to the company, it's, it's pocket change, not even that. But it is very, very rare that any company is being given any fine at all by this government agency. So that sort of underlines the seriousness of this security breach. And also our uh, Norwegian Data Protection Agency, they also issued 
uh, a reprimand to Telenor saying that this is really not good and you have basically violated two different GDPR articles on this. But since you have already been fined once, we are not going to slap another fine on top of that. That's usually not how it's being done here in Norway. And there's case number two, because I asked friends in, in other countries as well, can I try to hack your voicemail box? So with Telia in Denmark, um, um, you know, the version two uh, news website in Denmark, they tried this out on, on my behalf and they found that yep, this works. I proved it for them. I talked directly to Telia, they fixed it and they also ended up in news saying that, you know, this is a big scandal and it's not, not just in Denmark, it also applies to uh, another provider, uh, you know, other providers in Norway and in Sweden. <laughs> and uh, kind of fascinating that, you know, version two even have an article saying that Telia is now considering better voicemail security. So I'm sort of waiting to see what's going to happen there, but hopefully it has already improved. Case number three is Tele2, which is the third provider uh, that I found vulnerable in this. Based in Sweden, they operate in eight different countries. I tested against voicemail boxes of people in Sweden. I found them to be vulnerable. I got access to their voicemail. I do not know about the uh, you know, hackability of Tele2 voicemail boxes in other countries where they operate because I didn't test, uh, but Tele2 says, nope, they are not vulnerable. So hopefully that's uh, true. At least, again, this also led to media attention in Sweden. Again, back to you know, my fascination of the different ways of how this was handled or wasn't handled at, all, handled, handled at all in the different countries. In Norway, there was a lot of media attention on, on this. Mainstream media picked it up. There have been issued a fine, there have been uh, issued a reprimand by the Data Protection Agency of Norway. In Denmark, there have been a little bit of media attention, but politicians have said, well, the problem is fixed, so there's nothing left for us to do, and we'll just leave it to the telecom providers to, you know, they have to talk to each other and figure out what to do, and that's it. And in Sweden, pretty much nothing has happened at all so far. Uh, in fact, there were one or I think it was two or three articles in total about this and then it went completely quiet. But all in all, I found that several million people across Norway, Sweden and Denmark were affected by this and have most probably been affected for 13 years or more. At the same time, the telecom providers, they have logs that maybe go, go back uh, two, three, or four weeks in time. So proving or disproving that this haven't been hacked and abused by anyone for the past 13 years is completely impossible. So they have concluded that, well, since we haven't heard anyone complain about it, nobody have probably been hacked. And there's nothing we can do about that. So I just want to say that, you know, this is sort of still work in progress, but I would really, really, uh, you know, recommend you to listen in on the talk from Kelly Robinson on Sunday here at the Crypto and Privacy Village, where she will be talking about stir shaken. Not saying anything more than that, just listening to that talk. And by that, we have reached the end and I say thank you and I am ready for your questions now or you can contact me later. You have my cryptic uh, contact details here on screen. Thank you. Not saying anything more than that, just listening to that talk. And by that, we have reached the end and I say thank you and I am ready for your questions now or you can contact me later. That was the talk, Hacking Like Pear Selton 14 Years Later and Still Winning by Pear. Uh, 
we have them here for our live Q and A. So please put your questions in the Discord uh, CPV Q and A channel. Uh, so, Pear, uh, one of the first questions we have is: In the USA, many carriers use the phone number as a default PIN. So, if you spoof the number and call its voicemail, you can access it using the phone number as a default PIN. If the user didn't change it, and a lot of people don't, is that the same outside the US of other carriers? Well, I can say for sure that yeah, at least yeah. that's yeah. not what we have. Uh, that's not what we have here in Norway. I haven't seen this in in Sweden or Denmark, but I I really can't answer for all telecom providers in all the countries outside the US. That's impossible to do. But I do have my suspicions that you will find a lot of bad security connected to both uh, voicemail accounts and also in general, the uh, accounts where you can log in on your telco um, homepage for in any way administrating your subscription with them. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um... In your ideal world, uh, what would you like to see exist in place of the current available options that we do have? Well, th there are many facets to this. And one of the things that I pointed out early in my presentation, uh, presentation is starting with whenever you go into a shop and say that you want a new uh, uh, SIM card or if you want a data SIM card or a twin SIM card, if you want a new subscription, if you want to change it, if you want to end it, to move it to to another telco, and then you have the issues of logging onto your telco provider to administer your uh, subscription there, like you know this SMS copy service, which is now, uh, of course, uh, turned off, uh, and options like that. And then you also have the stuff like um, doing the the voicemail hacking using spoofed numbers. Now, some of the issues are sort of um, um, you know, they are specific to each telecom provider, like, you know, the, uh, the absence of two-factor authentication for uh, administrating your account. And then you have the security awareness training for staff on help desk, online chat, and in stores. But there are also problems with the, the basic uh, telco networks worldwide for mobile communication using the SS7, SS7 protocol and stuff like that. And that is, I'm not going to say it's an unsolvable problem, but it's not up to a single telecom provider to fix it. It's not up to a single country to fix it. And basically, you need, you know, if, if you are to fix the fundamental security issues that we have in the GSM networks today, all uh, providers and makers of phones, of networking equipment, all the telcos, they have to come up with solutions and you have to replace all the handsets in the world. And we can't do that. That's just impossible to expect that to basically ever happen. So one of the things that are coming now, which is very interesting, of course, as I said, Kelly Robinson will be talking about uh, stir shaking. Uh, so you know, I'm not going to spoil that anymore. But you know, that's a that's a talk that I really hope people will uh, listen into. And one of the things that I'm doing as well is trying to, you know, to the extent I can, I'm trying to pressure the Norwegian government and also the governments in, in Sweden and Denmark as well, together with other people, to ask the telcos to at least look into stir shaking and eventually also consider, can it be implemented? And how can we make the rest of the world implement it as well? So Thank long answer so to a short question. <laughs> wow, that was a really great thorough answer. Thank you so much. Um, so another question we have is, should we just disable our voicemails then at that point? Uh, uh, yeah, oh yeah, disable voicemail. Now, <laughs> I mean, there's absolutely no point. I can't really understand why people are using voicemail at all. And I, I was in, in Czech Republic um, last year, I think. And I was surprised to hear from friends in, in, in the Czech Republic that voicemail, nah, no, they don't have that with, with, with their phone subscriptions. And I asked around and they, couldn't think of any friends or family who had voicemail. In Norway, we have uh, uh, three companies that are providing a physical infrastructure for mobile, mobile communications. And then we have lots of virtual operators as well. And all of them, absolutely all of them, by default provide voicemail as a part of the service. 
and there actually is no option to say, I don't want voicemail, but they do have options to turn it off. So uh, one of the things that I would like to see is that, you know, well, I, I just don't need uh, voicemail at all. And I actually, well, I just don't pay for it either because I can turn it off, but I'm sort of still paying for it. Yeah, that's actually really, huh. I did not realize that was an option in other places like that. Thank you. Um, I, you kind of answered some of this question already, but someone asked, as a regular user, what can I do to protect myself, if anything, or is it completely out of my hands? Well, to protect yourself, you know, I, I'm, I'm working as a chief security officer for a large hotel chain. And I, of course, I've been asking uh, my colleagues and, and friends about this as well. You know, what do you think about this? And of course... Uh, I can say I have truly scared a lot of people by being able to sort of hack into their voicemail using a spoofed phone call and also making phone calls that appears to be coming from uh, your mom or your dad or your brother or whoever it is. Um, uh, and they are really surprised to see that I can do that. So there are some things you can do. And the very simple thing that you can do is that uh, whatever text message you are receiving or the phone number or the name that you see on in the display on your phone when somebody is calling you, do not trust it because it is except, exceptionally easy to spoof. And I don't know how, you know, I don't know, you know, you're in the US, so I don't know how much people in the US in general know about phone spoofing, you know, number spoofing and, and text message spoofing. But to people here in Norway, the vast majority of people in the IT security industry were absolutely clueless about this existing at all when I started working with this. And when I did my initial presentations last year, people were shocked that this was possible. So as an end user, first and foremost, do not trust that the number you see or the name you see in your display are correct. No matter who calls or texts you, do not trust it. As a millennial who does not pick up any phone calls at all, that's really fascinating to know about. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you youngsters. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you, you have a completely different sort of way to protect yourself in this area. But I, I know, again, robocalls, as far as I know, is a very big problem in the US. It, it, it almost doesn't exist over here yet except oh. for the operational Microsoft is calling you to say you have a computer virus on your on your system. That's that's the only robocalls we get. And when I got one last year, I was like, yes, finally. So there you go. That is a very different reaction that I, I have, I think, along with other people. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, with that said, thank you so much again, Pear, for all of your answers to this Q&A and for your talk today. Uh, please take care and enjoy the rest of your DEF CON. I thank hope you, you have fun. Me. Thank you so much again.